perspectives about our working together to improve pediatric quality of care, safety and efficiency across the continuum of care. We're delighted. As Lisa mentioned, we have over 35 lines registered with us this afternoon, and that means many more people because often our webinars welcome many people around conference tables uh, across the country. So thank you for joining us this afternoon and being a part of this important uh, session. Today's agenda, and, and we're already into part of it, is about welcoming everyone um, from, from a national perspective, but also to um, introduce you to the goals and objectives of CAPSI's Pediatric Practice uh, Guidelines Collaborative, and to just show you very quickly in some of these opening slides how it ties into CAPSI's strategic priorities. Um, we're also going to be looking at the process of just sharing with you, rather, the process that we implemented over the last 12 months or so um, to gain consensus on priority areas, priority areas that impact the health and well-being of our children and youth, and, um, and, and the priority areas, in fact, that we've landed uh, on to at least initiate our work together. That part of the presentation is going to be uh, shared with you by Anna Cooper, who is a nurse and clinical practice leader um, with uh, Bayshore Healthcare, um, who is a, a member uh, of CAFC. Um, following Anna's presentation, we are going to um, welcome uh, Dr. Jean-Paul Collet. Uh, JP is our professor and associate uh, head of research at the Department of Pediatrics at the University of British Columbia. Uh, JP and Anna are the co-chairs of our national steering committee for our pediatric practice guidelines. JP is going to share a true passion of his with everyone about what is a community of practice. Following JP, we are very delighted to be welcoming a longtime colleague and friend of CAFC's, and that is Dr. Bonnie Stevens. Uh, Bonnie is a professor of Lawrence S. Bloomberg Faculty of Nursing and Faculty of Medicine at the University of Toronto. And Bonnie is going to give us a very practical example of a, of a very successful community of practice around pain and child health. Uh, following Bonnie's presentation, and these are all about 10 minutes or so in length, so these are not long, but rather meant to just inform and, and, uh, and add more content to, uh, to this subject. Um, following Bonnie's presentation, we're going to welcome Lisa back to our virtual microphone, and Lisa's going to share our community of practice charter and a generic framework, as well as CAFC's Knowledge Exchange Network which becomes the virtual home of our community of practice and the uh, community of practices that we hope will, um, will now um, come to fruition as a result of the work that we're going to share with you this afternoon. Q&A as our second to last bullet is extremely important and we want to leave enough time on today's webinar, which will be um, one hour in, in length, to hear from you. Um, and Lisa has explained how to submit your questions. And um, um, I, I'm assuming many of you have participated in CAFC webinars where we use this format. And it does work very well from um, enabling an interaction. And then we'll just take all of sort of a summary of what we've shared today uh, and, uh, and share wrap up and uh, next steps. So just very quickly, CAFC's mission tied in with our strategic priorities. CAFC's mission is to support member and partner organizations through education, research, and quality improvement initiatives, all aimed at improving health service delivery for Canada's children and youth. Our four priorities, strategic priorities, are to establish programs and activities that address current and emerging child and youth health care priorities, advocating for transforming health service delivery for our children and youth, connecting service providers and key stakeholders to realize shared child and youth health care goals, as well as facilitating and fostering research 
brokering knowledge and educational opportunities and enhancing information exchange, again, for the community and members that we represent. And I think it's fair to say that all of those priorities truly fall into the goals and objectives of our Pediatric Practice Guidelines Collaborative. So what are um, the primary, primary goals of our, of our Guidelines Collaborative? So consistent with the mission that I just shared with you as well as our priorities, in the fall of 2011, we initiated a new national program focused on the development implementation and evaluation of pediatric practice guidelines. The primary objective of this initiative or collaborative is to improve healthcare practice quality, safety, and efficiency through a very positive and dynamic collaboration and to share ideas and experiences regarding the development, implementation, and evaluation of these guidelines. Our primary outcome, CAFC's primary role and outcome, is to support you, to support our child and youth healthcare organizations in Canada who provide essential health care to our children and youth across the continuum of care. And perhaps it's important to mention at this point, when we refer to the continuum of care, what we are talking about is our um, is, is that continuum from tertiary, quaternary care to community to rehab centers as well as home care provider agencies. And we really are very committed to that, um, to that continuum. We feel that we are uniquely positioned to together and, and, and it's together with our members, it's together with the individuals that have joined us on this webinar to influence system-wide change through our network of national organizations representing health professionals and member organizations across that continuum. A large part of our membership is at the grassroots level, and CAFC is able to affect change at the point of service delivery. Here are just a few examples of our collaboration or our, our collaborative, patient safety collaborative, which has been working together since 2003. Over the last three or four years, our pediatric opioid safety collaborative, medication reconciliation, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, our Canadian network of child and youth rehabilitation, interfacility transport, as well as our work as a KT partner with the CIHR team in pediatric pain research, which most of you probably realize has been led by Bonnie Stevens and many other leaders um, in that very successful collaborative across the country. Uh, CAFC's pediatric um, guidelines collaborative, as I mentioned, was officially launched just over a year and a bit ago. And we just wanted to share very briefly a bit of our work um, some of our accomplishments as well as work in progress. So what we have been able to, I, to do at this point is identify key priority areas and themes through a consensus building process, and Anna's going to walk you through that in just a moment. The four areas that we have selected to begin this work is complex care, pain, sepsis, and transition. We have also created, and this is a work in progress, an online interactive resource site on the CASI Knowledge Exchange Network, known as KEN. We, um, we are, in fact, hoping beyond today's call to begin to establish communities of practice within each of the four priority areas that I've identified in this first bullet. And we invite and welcome content experts, many of you that are with us on today's webinar, and we extend that to your respective networks within each of these priority areas to become COP, Community of Practice Leaders. We also, going forward, will work very hard at establishing broad national engagement with our child and youth health care community again referring to that uh, continuum of care. 
Um, CAFC's role um, is really, our, we are very committed to providing high-level support for the community at large. We will be responsible for organizing and advancing and communicating the work of our four COPs. We um, are also committed to promoting the value of the community of practice membership, encouraging growth and commitment and, and engagement. Talking about engagement, engaging the community membership through multiple knowledge translation strategies, ensuring that the community remains focused on our goals and objectives, monitoring activities and achievements. We're also committed to acting as the community's champion, your champion, promoting participation in activities and acknowledging successes. Um, providing CAFC's Knowledge Exchange Network as a platform, as a home for our communities of practice, and connecting the dots, connecting members with each other. And many of you have often heard me refer to our role as that of a national blue stick, and it really applies to this as well. Before turning over to Anna, I just want to acknowledge and thank, acknowledge the leadership of our National Steering Committee, I'll leave this slide up for you. And these are the, our National Steering Committee is also committed to overseeing and supporting the activities of our four communities of practice within each of our priority areas. And um, I really do wish to extend that very, very warm um, uh, thank you and, uh, and appreciation to, uh, to all. At this point um, in time, it is absolutely my pleasure to hand the virtual microphone over to Anna Cooper. And Anna, thank you for joining us this afternoon and for your leadership. All right. Thank you, Elaine. Um, first of all, you'll have to excuse me. I am getting over this flu bug. So if I do uh, cough and sputter a few times, that is why. Um, I'm going to spend just a, a few minutes to give a little bit of context as to the priority areas that, uh, that we have identified. And I know Elaine mentioned them a minute or two ago. Um, Lisa, do you want to go to the next slide, please? <clears throat> Thank you. So a couple of groups have, uh, have come together. And uh, Elaine mentioned earlier that the, the Pediatric Practice Guidelines Collaborative is a group that came together in uh, 2011. Uh, and, you know, they were working uh, during that time. I was, I was actually not uh, part of that group, unfortunately. Um, I, am, I am now, and I'm very pleased to be. Uh, they were working on identifying these areas and, and, and figuring out how they would, uh, they would work through developing these practice guidelines. Um, also, around the same time, a group uh, came together, um, and, and I was part of that group, in fact, led that group. We were a group uh, looking at developing pediatric outcome measures. Uh, and we came together really to initially see if there was uh, some sort of set of measures that could be used in a, in a variety of settings. Uh, in that group, we had home care, we had acute care, we had an academic uh, representation, and we had representation from CAFC. And we were looking to see if there were some outcome measures that were pertinent to, to uh, pediatric care across uh, different organizations and across the continuum of care, and could this be something then that we could adopt uh, in the areas that we were each working in? Um, and while we were both working side by side, these two groups, I think we, uh, through the interaction and synergy between the two, we began to recognize that really pulling these groups together would be would be most likely the best way that um, that we could proceed. So I believe it was middle of last year we formally merged the two groups. I joined the Pediatric Practice Guidelines Collaborative um, along with some of the other members of the uh, Pediatric Outcome Measures Committee. Um, both of those groups, though, were also spending some time looking at criteria that would be used uh, for determining what priority areas we would be focusing on. And I'll go over that in, uh, in just a minute. The other thing that... Uh, was also part of this, though, was uh, some work that was done at the uh, at the fall CAFC conference in Vancouver. Um, and again, I'll, I'll go into that in a minute. I think, Lisa, if you can do the next slide. 
So initially, there were quite a few uh, areas of, uh, of focus that were identified, be it in the Pediatric Outcome Measures group, be it in the uh, Pediatric Practice Guidelines group, and even from people related to that, you know, who were coming up with suggestions of areas that we should be focusing on, and, and they are on the slide here in front of you. No coincidence that some of the ones that we, that we picked certainly were on this in the early days, and uh, there has been quite a bit of uh, discussion along the way as to uh, you know, which of these should be, should be um, agreed upon, and were there others that we should be adding to this. Um, next slide, please, Lisa. So as I said though earlier, one of the things that we did try and do is outline a, a, a list of criteria for how we would identify those priority areas. So in essence, sort of some rules that we could apply to, to ideas that came forward and, and could we then move and, and, and identify a more refined list based on this, um, on this list. So we were looking at things that had an impact on multiple systems, either within organizations or across organizations. Uh, we were looking at priority areas that were relevant to the continuum of care, so things that were applicable to acute care, uh, to community care, rehab, home care, uh, really all of those areas. We, we wanted uh, areas of focus that would apply to all of that. We wanted something that, you know, we, we felt confident that there was uh, solid evidence for impact and uh, positive outcome uh, based on the work that we did. Um, I'll skip over the next one just because I'll, I'll, I'll bring it back to that in a second. Certainly, we wanted to identify something where there was an evidence of a gap, and there's there's a lot of uh, a lot of things on our list that uh, that fit into that one quite well. Um, we wanted something that we felt confident that there was sufficient scientific evidence to uh, to be able to make sure that we could that we could have some outcomes that we could measure. We could identify these outcomes because if we weren't able to do that, it would have been very difficult in the end to to recognize that we had actually achieved what we set out to do. Certainly, we wanted leadership engagement because without that, it, you know, we all know that it would be very difficult to move forward. Uh, evidence that uh, that there was some issues related to cost uh, and cost effectiveness of developing these guidelines. So, you know, was there going to be a real cost benefit uh, to do that? Certainly, something that was feasible, and, and you'll see in a moment that there was a couple that we really felt, while they were very uh, notable realistically we might be challenged to actually implement that. We were ideally looking at something that results in high morbidity or high mortality. And, uh, and as we said, something too that was interdisciplinary, so something that really had impact across the health system. So if you can do the next slide, uh, Lisa. Very simple though uh, on this slide, the message uh, across the board, everybody that we spoke with though, that one of the key pieces is that we really wanted something that was going to be embedded in a family-centered framework. So whatever it was that we picked, we had to always keep that in mind. <coughs> well, the next one, please. So after the, the CAFC conference, um, <clears throat> actually during the CAFC conference, there was a survey done of the participants. Uh, there was also an opportunity for participants to actually speak out. So whether it was a verbal or, or written participation, uh, we did get some feedback from a lot of uh, participants there. And these, yet again, were the areas that seemed to keep bubbling to the top. So following the CAFC conference, there was a two-day workshop attended by over 30 people, I believe, representing really all aspects of pediatric care across the country. Uh, there was significant decision or discussion on these uh, areas, and with those criteria that I mentioned earlier, we uh, we came to the the conclusion that the four that Elaine has uh, has mentioned, and that is, you know, pain, sepsis, transitions, and and whether we broaden that to transitions from pediatric to adult or transitions across uh, you know various levels of the continuum of care, but transitions and uh, children with medical complexities. Those are the four that we landed on. We did recognize certainly that mental health and childhood obesity fit many of the criteria that we had outlined. However, we felt that unfortunately they were both very, very broad, very different, difficult to, uh, to really identify measurable outcomes, and very <laughs> challenging to implement at this point. I think we all did acknowledge at the end of the workshop that you know, following the, the work that we do for these priority areas that we have identified the four, that there is potential opportunity in these two areas to do some work down the road. 
So those are the four areas. Um, these ones here, uh, and these are the four that we are going forward with, and I know we will be talking a little bit further about them. Um, so I think next, uh, J.P. Collet is going to tell you a little bit about communities of practice. Hello, everyone. Um, so the, this presentation, uh, sorry, show my screen. Beautiful slide. <laughs> I think. Okay. So uh, th this presentation is, is, is related to guidelines in the sense that besides being a good place for developing guidelines, the community of practice uh, represents a, a unique way to implement guidelines and also to improve practice. So what, um, I don't know if you remove this one here. So I, I will cover three um, parts. The um, describing the healthcare system being a complex adaptive system. The community of practice as a way to exchange and learn within such a system, and then community of practice uh, to promote changes in the healthcare system. So um, we know that uh, the most important part of this slide is at the very bottom, all the other parts are illustrations, that there is a huge gap between recommended care and the care actually practiced. Uh, so um, basically regarding guidelines, there is more publication regarding the difficulty to implement guidelines rather than the uh, oh. guidelines themselves. So. Um, Important distinction um, when we talk about system and within a, a very complex system like healthcare, we can distinguish what is called mechanical systems. And I give two examples of a small one, uh, the uh, switch, the electrical wires and the bulb for um, turning the light on and the macro system being the airplane which is often used as in contrast to the healthcare system to see how the airplane industry is good compared to the um, health system. And these two uh, uh, systems, micro or macro mechanical systems, are heavily predictable because they are mechanical. So basically, if there is a, a defect, it's uh, a matter of finding where the defect uh, lies and then to transform and then the mechanical systems can work better. The adaptive system is different. In the yellow box, the complex adaptive system is a collection of individual agents that have the freedom to act in ways that are not always predictable and whose actions are interconnected such as one agent's action changes the context for other agents. And we can see also that there is some micro system or macro system. And uh, the, the complexity in the macro system is that, uh, you know, in one unit, like the intensive care unit, for instance, you, you have uh, a couple of hundreds of individuals who are, you know, acting together, but they are also interacting with an, another uh, division, like with pharmacy, with lab, and so it is in fact uh, multiple systems that uh, create the, um, the healthcare system. And this picture represents uh, the uh, <coughs> spectrum of uh, activities from this corner here where it is a mechanical system situation where <coughs> guidelines are uh, very likely to apply because everything is predictable and can be controlled. While in this situation when we move to uh, this direction, it becomes less predictable and there is in between a zone of complexity. The complexity lies on, on the fact that uh, it's very hard to know precisely what will be the impact of any intervention and difficult then to predict what will be the future of a system. 
um, and to, to relate uh, very precisely uh, a certain type of intervention to, to what expected outcomes. So uh, we can, for different situations, we may fall here. It would be, for example, uh, a technical uh, surgery in which uh, there is very little uh, variability and everyone should practice the same way. So then in situations like that, the uh, checklist uh, would work very well and guidelines can work very well as well. Why in situations where uh, there, there are many factors for um, implementing the care. We talk more about pathways and uh, there may be different ways to provide uh, the care with the same degree of success. And when we are here, it's, it's problematic because it becomes totally unpredictable and then it has an effect on the overall production. So um, instead of uh, these pictures that you find everywhere in the domain of quality improvement and uh, finding uh, the discouraging pictures of uh, the difficulty to implement guidelines with regard to uh, individual factors, uh, organizational factors, societal factors and in the environment. It is nice to, it's, a, it's another way to see that uh, the care provider is part of a unit which is part of an institution of a health system at provincial level, at national level. And each level has a specific culture, knowledge, attitude, behavior, mission, values, etc. And the same thing for the uh, patients. And it explains that if you multiply uh, care providers by 200 in one specific unit, and by uh, thousands in one institution, um, you, you will realize immediately that in fact the complexity is very natural and of course there will be factors at individual level, at the environmental level. And uh, the question is how could we work with this knowledge in order to make the system improving and this is where community of practice uh, comes into, into play. So this is on this picture from basic knowledge to efficacy, effectiveness knowledge, leading to evidence-based knowledge for an objective of good practice. We find that the guidelines fall at this level and there is also a group of research action at knowledge translation and continuous quality improvement. But there is also <coughs> another body of knowledge which is called practice knowledge. And the difference between evidence-based knowledge and practice knowledge is the fact that evidence-based knowledge is uh, coming from the literature and it's well known after, you know, as technology assessment synthesis of information to produce guidelines and it's called the explicit knowledge because it's known by everyone and it's published often. Um, this one is called in contrast the tacit knowledge and tacit because people, what people know by culture is often not recognized as, uh, as a knowledge they have and uh, this tacit knowledge may be different from one institution to the other because it's part of the culture from one individual to the other as well and it is not um, usable easily because it's not known. So <clears throat> the community of practice falls at this level as being the best way to combine evidence-based knowledge and practice knowledge with the objective to improve quality of practice. <clears throat> and then going through the implementation of guidelines. So a community of practice um, defined by Wenger with a key name in this area is a group of people who share an interest in something and come together to develop knowledge around this topic in order to use it in practice. So it's very practical. The, it's not theoretical knowledge, it's uh, 
applied knowledge to improve practice. The second uh, <coughs> definition um, or pieces of information um, focus on, on, the, uh, on the fact that what I said before, it is a place where tacit knowledge is actively integrated with explicit knowledge and then making easier to, <coughs> to um, implement uh, the uh, guidelines which is coming from explicit knowledge. And that uh, statement is very important, showing the power of community of practices, because the, the model touches all the practice change theoretical models with impact of learning, socializing, and managing. Basically, it is uh, at, in a complex adaptive system, the best way uh, to uh, provoke a change in the system and then uh, for our particular concern to improve practice. So in a specific knowledge domain, the community of practice uh, includes three components. The individuals who are part of the, each individual, the, their social interaction, which is the, the communication, exchange of information, and the context, the environment. Then the knowledge uh, arrives, it's a guidelines in this situation, and then the knowledge use is the output. And this process of uh, interacting, discussing, exchanging, uh, increase the, the capacity of the group to, um, to use the existing knowledge. So this is the same uh, picture where the knowledge from different sources reaches the community of practice. And here, just to sh show that it is an iterative cycle that by knowing what is the output of the knowledge use can lead to more information that could go back <coughs> to the initial entry system where we identify the knowledge gaps and then uh, we, we see that there is a continuous improvement capacity within community of practice and for that part this is a role of participatory action research. The uh, action research is in fact researching this component leads to further discussion at community of practice level for further improvement. So the community of practice has also several advantages at individual level and institutional level. There are uh, important benefits that often leads a community of practice to be well accepted by members. So it uh, brings opportunity to access new knowledge for the participants to provide uh, to remain current in areas of expertise, increase work effectiveness, and reflective practice is part of it. Leads to collective sense of uh, purpose and belonging. The participatory action research has been found to be, in fact, one way to decrease the burnout potential for recognition, career visibility, because there is a research component. And at organizational level, increased credibility as part of knowledge partnership, collective strength, more effective so problem solving to influence policy, new funding uh, opportunities. So the community of practice itself could become uh, a powerful media to bring uh, new ideas at a high level and um, to be recognized. And then uh, also playing a role of, of advocacy for certain part of that uh, of, of their common activity. So there are hundreds of community of practices with different uh, success. Um, the improved care now um, is a very powerful one for uh, IBD, and uh, I will show one of their uh, statements at the end. Commun uh, Vermont Oxford Network 
involve 900 uh, intensive care, neonatal intensive care units uh, around the world, sharing information and improve care in the intensive care unit. So um, there, there are good models for that. This is the improve care now statement to transform the health care and costs for all children and adolescents with Crohn's disease this is there, and uh, ulcerative colitis by building a sustainable collaborative chronic care network, which is a community of practice, enabling patients, families, clinicians, and researchers to work together in a learning healthcare system to accelerate innovation, discovery, and the application of new knowledge. This slide is from uh, Rick Colletti, who is the, uh, the leader in this uh, Improved Care Now uh, network. So how to create a COP? It is both simple and, and difficult. And these are, we will talk about uh, this part. The uh, Eileen showed uh, the type of support we can get from CAPC, but there are also uh, good guidelines for developing community of practices. So um, the different aspects, I'm close to the end now, um, several rules. Uh, it can develop spontaneously or after seeding, but it does not work from a bottom up. Then, um, it cannot be forced to develop, so it has to be bottom up to engage people and make them participating. And distributed leadership is an important aspect because uh, it is not uh, a single leader leading everything. So it, the trick is to give enough room for everyone to play a role and be comfortable with the development of the community. In conclusion, it's a place where tacit and explicit knowledge meet around best practices a place where participants learn and change practice. And community of practice is a place where people develop a sense of belonging and meaning. So it's a good structure to develop and implement guidelines. So I'm going to pass the uh, microphone to uh, Bonnie Steven, who is going to talk about the experience in chronic pain, man acute and chronic pain management in, in Canada. Uh, showing uh, existing community of practices and possible future. Thank you. Thank you very much, JP. Um, as JP has so eloquently said, um, a collaborative is a group of people who work together with the same objective to improve pro uh, practice. So I'm going to give you an example of a community of practice that has really addressed the issue of pain in children. And we know that all children experience pain. Uh, hospitalized children undergo, on average, about six painful procedures per, uh, per day. This is data from uh, 2011 that we collected at eight uh, pediatric hospitals in Canada. About one-third of these children report that pain is moderate to severe. Children also say that pain is the worst part of hospitalization and the part that healthcare professionals need to pay attention to. We also know that children have acute and chronic pain. They have chronic pain from headache, abdominal pain, back pain, musculoskeletal pain, and multiple pains. And you can see that there's a broad uh, estimation of the percentage of children that are affected by chronic pain. We also know that Chronic pain is higher uh, in girls and lower uh, socioeconomic statuses. So with that background, we developed a research collaborative to really look at uh, pain in children, and it's called uh, Pain in Child Health. This is a strategic uh, training initiative in health research that's funded by CIHR. And the goal is to strengthen the preparation of trainees to become independent investigators in pediatric pain. The most important function is to develop a community of scholars, though, because we know that no one does research on their own. So the idea of a community and network is fundamental 
to this uh, consortium. Pitch offers funding for trainees, an annual institute, national web-based lab meetings, visits to other labs, international speakers, and a web-based pain course. So these are some of the activities of the PITCH uh, collaboration. Who is PITCH? Well, mostly it's trainees with a commitment to improving pain practice and outcomes through pain research. The trainees are from any, any discipline and at any level in their training. The major training centers are Halifax, Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver, but we are also fortunate to have international trainees and they're from all over the world. If we look at some of the uh, components of PITCH, we can see that it's not only funding and networking, but a focus on system change, personal development, the development of research and knowledge to action skills, mentoring, and uh, multidisciplinarity. So we'll just look briefly at each of these. In terms of uh, systemic change, really looking at incentives to help increase the number of clinician scientists. So these are scientists that are trained as clinicians that have at least 50% of their time protected to do research in this area. Uh, this is accomplished through earlier outreach to students, awards, and also uh, continuing to uh, integrative programs. There's a need for a multifaceted approach involving government, hospitals, industry, and universities to try and tra change the status quo within systems. Funding, we're always looking for more funding uh, for health research. And we are, this group helps to advocate for non-biomedical research support. It facilitates access to funds for its members and provides funding to establish infrastructure for research-related activities. For example, dedicated scientific writers, knowledge brokers, biostatisticians, et cetera. The focus is on multidisciplinarity in PITCH. We want to train researchers to work in multidisciplinary teams. And this is particularly adaptable to the concept of pain. Uh, the collaborative research projects uh, evolve from the beginning of training. There's innovation through cross-fertilization with other disciplines. And there's successful research that increases, increasingly requires multidisciplinary approach. Networking is the key uh, benefit that trainees tell us about PITCH. It allows for increased contact. And this can be enabled through uh, technological advances such as the internet. So it isn't just the annual uh, institute where people get together face to face. There's both inter and intradisciplinary networking. Uh, international uh, networks are set up. We've been able to engage stakeholders uh, at all levels. And uh, we've been able to partner with some stakeholders, such as partnering uh, with industry. This collaborative also provides a, an opportunity for mentoring uh, with very senior researchers who are part of the pitch management team and co-investigators. And we address mentoring through research, through clinical practice. We address uh, key issues such as work-life balance, uh, mentoring skills for trainees and new investigators and mentoring as a professional activity. Uh, so example around financial incentives and recognition through awards. Of course, this is a, a collaborative about developing research skills. So we really focus on that development. Uh, we offer training from both the basic and applied sciences. Uh, we foster independent thinking combined with an ability to think across disciplines. We are trying always to create new networks and selecting consultants. Uh, we focus on developing a research program and core knowledge translation skills. Uh, as I said earlier, there's a variety of activities uh, that are supported through PITCH. Uh, we, about 70% of our funding is for funding um, 
stipends for students, uh, but we also have multidisciplinary trainees that are funded through a separate fund. Rise and Live is the uh, internet learning opportunity. We have a very successful listserv uh, out of the IWK. Uh, newsletters, annual institutes, uh, mentoring on a one-to-one -one and group basis from the pitch faculty, as well as through other trainees and individuals. Uh, we meet through pitch and through networking. Uh, we have many financial partners. As I said, uh, pitch is funded through the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, but we receive funding from the U.S. May Day Fund, which helps us to fund the international trainees, the Edwards Foundation in Montreal, the Nova Scotia Health uh, Research Foundation, uh, Janssen Ortho from industry, and then uh, many of the universities. And of course, we have had much collaboration with CAFC. That goes without saying. I'll just finish up. Uh, this is the pitch curriculum. And so this really looks at the various uh, components of enhancing the research skills around pain. And you can see that many of these, uh, for example, the pain assessment, the intervention and prevention, uh, this, uh, have to do with very uh, clinically uh, relevant areas, as well as study design and ethics and knowledge translation. And then we have output, such as scholarly activities and career development. So in summary, what is the impact of PITCH as a collaborative? Our goal is to build research capacity. We are looking for improved pediatric pain practice uh, through research, uh, generating research evidence and translating research into practice guidelines, uh, maintaining and expanding networks helping trainees and mentors and pitch faculty to secure funding. We want to build sustainable infrastructure so that when the pitch initiatives uh, die down, we can actually sustain this initiative and creating national and international partnerships. So that is a quick, uh, very quick overview about uh, pitch, which we present to you today as an example of a collaborative or community of practice. So I think with that, I will hand this back to Lisa. Well, hello. So we've just seen a great example of, um, of a community of practice uh, for research and developing research. So um, CAPC is, is um, more focused on on practice and uh, health service delivery. So I'm going to show you the Knowledge Exchange Network very quickly. So this will be our, um, our virtual COP platform. And we've had uh, some success uh, using this platform. <laughs> we've had some, some success with uh, our Knowledge Exchange Network uh, in uh, many areas. Um, so for those who aren't familiar, uh, CAN is a wiki-based online community, and there's three levels of access. So public, so it is on our website. You can access it. So anybody can access the Knowledge Exchange Network and look at all of the information on there. When you become a member, if you uh, register up here to become a member, um, you uh, will be able to leave comments or, um, or uh, yes, basically you can leave comments on uh, the existing um, uh, content. Once you become an author, you can start creating content and lead discussions. So that's when things get quite interesting. So uh, as I said, we've used this platform successfully sort of in an informal way as a, a COP, community of practice. So we've used uh, for um, um, developing um, patient safety curriculum for the pediatric residency program. Uh, we've used it for uh, developing a pediatric uh, opioid safety uh, resource kit. And we've done a safety competencies challenge where we've developed a resource for organizations to use 
when they're developing or enhancing their patient safety program. And in the interest of time today, I think I'm just going to have to let everybody go in and, and take a look themselves to see um, all the great resources in there. Those were all developed in collaboration with many of um, CASTI's member organizations, so individuals went in. We worked together to, to build these resources, and they're up here for people to uh, steal shamelessly and to um, share their work as well. So right now, with our Pediatric Practice Guidelines Collaborative, we're establishing a, a more formal community of practice. And um, everybody sh should have received, I seem to have lost my mouse here, everybody should have received um, a community charter. And I'm just going to bring that up on the screen for a moment. And Elaine went over um, CAPC's role in the community of practice as the community sponsor and what that means to be a community sponsor. My screen is freezing up here a bit, of course. So these are all the, a description of, of, of um, our tasks and our role as a community sponsor. So as we, as we go through this, as we're developing our um, communities of practice, the uh, scope of, I'm just going to get right back to the front. So of each of these communities of practice is going to be determined by the individual COPs. As you work together, as um, you establish your leadership, you're going to just these, these topics, these identified priority areas, are quite large. So there's going to have to be a bit of a focused scope in each of those areas. What problem is going to be solved with this community of practice? And that's for each of, each of the individual communities to decide themselves. Um, but our, our overarching goal is the establishment of uh, practice guidelines within each of these priority areas. And we want a community that's going to support the implementation process at a national level. So as we get back to those roles and responsibilities, CAFC is um, the community sponsor, high level. We're going to make sure that, this, that these communities of practice run and that there's engagement and uh, there's acknowledgement and that we encourage the community growth. And we're going to be out there uh, plugging this all the time. Our steering committee, as Elaine introduced earlier, they're going to help to guide the, the purpose and the, the intent, and they're going to provide some oversight. Now we get down to subject matter experts, experts who are COP leaders. So this is, this is the CAFC community. We're looking for our, our um, subject matter experts. We're looking for a community of practice leaders. You're the ones with the knowledge and the experience. Who, who understand what the issues are and who will be able to, uh, to help lead all of this work and, and put it into practice uh, when, when it's the right time. We're going to need content editors who I will support. And my role is the facilitator. And I'm here to help you in your role as community leader, content editors, and COP members. And I'm here to teach you how to use all the tools on the Knowledge Exchange Network. I'm here to make sure that you can connect with the people that you need to connect to and that we meet regularly uh, as in our individual groups to, uh, to develop our, our work plan going forward. And I'm sorry I feel like I'm rushing through this right now, but I really would like to give everybody some time to, uh, to ask some questions or make some comments. And so I think I might just pass it back to Elaine for the time for this moment. Thanks, Lisa. I just want to say thank you to Anna, JP, Bonnie, and to Lisa for just helping us set, set the stage for, uh, for our communities of practice. Lisa just talked about in the charter subject matter experts and we know that we have welcomed many colleagues to today's webinar that are, in fact, our subject matter experts representing the four priority areas that we're going to begin this work on. And, and that, of course, is complex care, uh, pain transition, and, uh, and sepsis. And uh, 
I, I'd like to sort of, I'm not sure if we have, it doesn't look like we've got any questions at this point. I'm just wondering, maybe Lisa, just uh, to repeat the process if anyone does have any questions. Sure, if you have any questions or comments, uh, please uh, either raise your hand, I'll try to unmute your line, or you can type them into your um, control panel. Uh, it should be on the right side of your screen. Okay. So while we're, and again, you know, don't, don't be shy. If, if we have confused you, pose some questions that we can address that confusion. And uh, if you're wondering um, about how to take, how to come with us as we take this to the next step, by all means, um, share, share your thoughts and questions. In terms of next steps, um, we've talked a little bit in the, in my very first introductory slides about what we've done thus far. So we have established the methodology around uh, developing, implementing, and evaluating our practice guidelines. Um, we're going to use the AGREE tools to, to do that. Um, we have established our priorities, and, uh, and we've talked about those in many of the presentations this afternoon. Our next steps, which are extremely important, is to actually get down to the nitty gritty, get down to work, and establish our four communities of practice. And this is where we're looking to our subject matter experts, our partners, who will bring that expertise and something that's very important to match or to marry with the expertise, and that's your passion. Um, I've had the honor for many years of working with some of you that, that are online today and many others who have dedicated entire careers to transitioning from just as one example or one part of that big scope that uh, Lisa talked about, um, transitioning from acute, from pediatric care to adult care. Um, and this is an opportunity to bring your passion and your expertise um, to to a reality, if you will, or to continue to, to bring that to a, to a national level. Um, so we really invite you to, um, to, come, and, to come and share that with us. Um, our role, as we said, is to support the COPs that are going to be led by our content experts. I'm going to stop, and uh, Lisa's got a first question to, uh, to share with us. Okay, so it's a very good question. What is the time frame? Is this a long-term, ongoing project, or does this have a set, shorter timeline? So this uh, this is a long-term this is long-term work. We we recognize that um, that this is going to take a while to do. This um, de developing guidelines takes a long time, and although we realize that there are a lot of guidelines already developed. Going through all of those and doing um, the systematic reviews of those specific guidelines and and uh, coming to consensus within a community of practice on those on those guidelines and the whole implementation process, it's going to take a very long time. This is going to take years. Yeah, and this and this is a long term commitment. Uh, we realize that this doesn't happen in 12 months, but we are very committed to. And, and this, these will be goals that will be set within each of the COPs. You know, we can we can set sort of 12-month milestones and then work together toward those. But again, we're in this as a long-term commitment. And based on that, I want to take an opportunity and realize I hadn't done that before to recognize the financial support um, that has come to this initiative from BC Children's Hospital Foundation as well as Bayshore Health. And um, we certainly hope to welcome other uh, funders and, and partners as we go along, but it has really been these two partners that have enabled um, all of the work that's been done, uh, done to date. So, and just another comment, in, in each of these areas, we are going to need um, so subject matter experts. We're going to need methodologists. We need people who understand change management. We need perspectives of family. We need frontline um, frontline people who have to um, implement 
whatever guidelines are going to be decided on. So at different at different points in this this whole process, we're going to need input from every level. And uh, we want to ensure that we have that input and that we have everybody's voice in at the appropriate time. Exactly. Okay. So just, can, just to sort of complete these next steps and, and maybe do a bit of a, a wrap, and again, if there's a burning question um, that's out there, we, we will sneak time in for one, one or two more. So how are we going to accomplish this, this being establishing our four COPs? Um, we are looking to you, to members of our child and youth health care community, to step forward, to come and join us in this exciting collaboration. Embrace this opportunity to mobilize your vision and share your expertise. How? Simply, um, not to put this all on Lisa's shoulders, I promise there's lots of people to support, but contact Lisa and, the, and uh, Lisa's email address is right here. Uh, expressing your interest, additional questions, how we can go about this together. We will facilitate regular, likely monthly, COP uh, teleconferences, webinars um, within each of the four priority areas. And as a milestone, uh, one of our milestones that we will, we will strive for over the next 12 months, we will do a check-in. Not sure what the check-in point will look like at this point in time. Again, that will be decided by our communities. But we'll do a check-in at Cassie's 2013 um, annual conference in Toronto, um, which will take place between October 20th and 23rd of, uh, of this year. So at this point in time, um, again, I want to, to thank Anna and um, Anna Cooper, Jean-Paul Collet, Bonnie Stevens, and Lisa um, for, our, um, uh, for your tremendous leadership. Um, I also want to thank all of our colleagues who have joined us this afternoon and this morning, I guess, in BC um, for, uh, for the webinar. Um, Take away the information that we have shared with you. Um, again, as Lisa mentioned right at the start, all of these presentations, lots more information about the Pediatric Practice Guidelines Collaborative is up on the CAFSI uh, Knowledge Exchange Network. And um, let's, let's move together with, uh, with some of these very important next steps. Um, we do have a registration list of everyone who's been on the call today. We're going to continue to communicate, and we certainly hope to hear from you uh, following today's call. Lisa, did you want to add anything else to that? So, no, I, just I just want to thank everybody for joining us today and uh, remind you that, as uh, Elaine said, on the Knowledge Exchange Network, you can find uh, much more background information on the Guidelines Collaborative. You can uh, uh, see all of the presentations from our workshop and uh, the, actually even the original concept paper. So if you're looking for a little bit more background before um, you want to ask me any questions or after you ask me questions, uh, you can find it all there. <laughs>